Our story begins long ago, in ages past that have long been forgotten and left to myth, legend, and whispers. But as history has been written, there are looming questions that yet remain, and as we seek understanding and knowledge, we too might be driving ourselves ever into a new calamity, as we, perhaps unwillingly, become an agent of chaos born out of the light. Hello and welcome to the story so far for Final Fantasy XIV. My name is Brian and in this video we hope to highlight and summarize the story so far from the prehistory of Eorzea all the way up to its latest chapter, Stormblood, leading us into Shadowbringers. If you don't want any of the story ruined, I'd recommend you book this for a later date. This video hopes to highlight and tell you the story, not necessarily in chronological order, of the history of Eorzea, the Warrior of Light, the Science of the Seven Dawn, the Crystal Tower, and so on and so forth. So consider this your spoiler warning before we actually dive in. Now there are many stories told within Final Fantasy XIV and many characters with wonderful relationships. In this video I hope to touch on the core story at hand. As such, there may be a character that you love and aren't really fully represented in this video. If you'd like me to explore a more in-depth lore post on a certain character or family of characters, please let me know in the comments below. We pulled this information from a variety of sources. We'll also include links in the description below so you can go and check that out for yourself. Now the content of this video is planning on covering the prehistory and things you should know, 1.0 and 2.0, but that does not mean that we're not going to hint and talk about things within 3.0 and 4.0. So spoiler warnings all around We'll be doing other videos to kind of bring this all together and finish off this series, so keep an eye out for that. Links will be in the description as well as a playlist below. Anyway, so with all that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Hopefully you like this video, and if you do, well, hopefully you hit that like button. Anyway, let's do this thing. So the prehistory and things to be aware of. On life and ether, within all beings, whether it be a man, animal, or even plant, does ether flow. It is the spark which grants life to the lifeless. Conversely, death can be said to occur once Aether has left the corporeal object. From this, it is clear to see why many scholars have used the words life and ether interchangeably. It can be assumed that a young man of sound mind and body will possess a high concentration of ethereal energy in his humors, whereas an older man, or one inflicted with corruption, will not. Some scholars have expanded upon the hypothesis, stating that the consumption of food serves not only to fill the belly, but to provide the body with ether lost through exertion. Ether is by no means static. It constantly flows throughout creation, forming currents throughout the earth, water, and air, which ensures that life is sustained through the world. The stoppage of these currents would be akin to the atrification of a limb being cut from the heart. Ether is the lifeblood of Hydaelyn. Without it, she and her children would perish. This is from Book 1, page 8 of the Lore Book. So the best place to start with understanding is obviously in the beginning. You have two forces at play here, Hyden, which is also the name of the planet, and Zodiac, represented by the moon. Now some 10,000 to 12,000 years ago, we have been told that Zodiac wanted more power. So Hydaelyn banished him, and in doing so, she sundered herself into 14 shards, each being a copy of herself. As the Warrior Light makes their way into the scene, the world and version of Eorzea takes place on the source. What we've been told is the original that was copied, yet we've also learned that in these copies, being that they happened so long ago, they aren't necessarily like our version any longer. Over the time and in the game, and namely taking place in the Heavensward expansion, we learn from visitors from the first that the location that we're actually going to be handing in Shadowbringers, that they have actually crossed over to the source in order to try to save their shard. It is in this revelation that we have had our first real contact with the other Warrior of Light, now turned to the Warrior of Darkness, who is being influenced by the Asians in order to try and bring about another calamity and ultimately the rejoining. It is believed that with the rejoining, Zodiac will be able to take his rightful place among Hydaelyn and the rest of the world, or Maybe that's not true. <laughs> we'll find out soon enough. Now, Eorzea's history actually revolves around a series of umbral and astral areas. The first umbral area marked the end of the Age of Gods, the guardian deities of Eorzea known as the Twelve. Now, retreating from a direct involvement with mortals during this time, umbral eras have followed by periods of enlightenment and cultural growth called astral eras. The third astral area was particularly noted for prescribing over the Algian Empire in the ancient civilization 
whose technology far exceeded the level of the modern age. Each umbral and astral pair corresponded with the six basic elements. Now this is wind, lightning, fire, earth, ice, and water. The sixth umbral era was believed to be the last, and the civilized races hoped that the seventh astral era would last forever. But unfortunately, they would be found incorrect, and we're going to cover that in the 1.0 section of this video. So there's a lot to unpack here. Let's first start with the Asians. These are agents of Zodiac, and they're here to influence the realm and cause these calamities. Those earth-shattering events that we have seen such raw destruction, Heidelin has had no choice but to consume one of the shards, aka the copies, back into herself to heal. And in doing so, pretty much causing a mass genocide on that shard. The Asians can actually also possess people, living or dead, and we've seen this multiple times throughout the entire story of Final Fantasy XIV. The Asians are also very difficult to kill. It's going to take a ton of ether, a ton of energy to be able to do so, because pretty much if you strike one down, you're only striking down the body in which they possess. They're just going to move along and possess another body. Thus, reoccurring Asian characters are seen throughout the story. However, we will end up dealing with them and it will be ultimately pretty satisfying. Now, with that prehistory and knowledge out of the way, let's go ahead and dive into Final Fantasy XIV 1.0. The story begins some 20 odd years before the player sets foot in Eorzea, where the Guardian Empire has invaded Almingo and the army was then led by the Black Wolf, who was able to actually capture the city-state with little to no resistance. Now 1.0 opens up with its cutscene where a major battle is being fought over Mordona between the Empire and Dragons, and we could see that their main flagship airship was taken down by the mighty Mitzgar Sormer, where, when crashing into the ground, that it released so much ethereal energy into the world that it was both blinding and it ended up reshaping Mordona forever. This ended up halting the Empire's advancements while they worked to use subterfuge to destable the area and find more reasons to be able to attack the fading alliance between the remaining city-states in the region. So the story of 1.0 is pretty weird. Obviously, Final Fantasy XIV had some issues with its launch and had some issues as putting it very politely. So there was a main story in which the player is teaming up with the refugees from Alamingo to try and take them back. Obviously, the Empire is brainwashing the children of Almingo to be able to join the Empire. That's part of how they survive. That's part of how the Empire grows throughout all of this. Namely, in growing and gathering the children, they the Empire has no ability to use magic. Any natural born Garlean is not magically inclined. So the only really way they can have it as part of their forces is doing it by recruiting. And the best way to do that by recruiting is taking over a place and then having the, uh, the citizens and the children basically grow up as Empire citizens and thus join the ranks of the Empire. Obviously, the Almingans are not very pleased with this fact and they want to take it over, but the Black Wolf is essentially too strong and we are pretty much thwarted at every turn. So the story kind of, of 1.0 has this weird conclusion right there. However, through the story and the patches leading up into 2.0, it takes a different turn. We see a character by the name of Neil Bandarnas make his way onto the stage. He having the idea to essentially resurrect something called the Meteor Project, in which the Garleans discovered a way to call down the Lesser Moon Dalmon and use it as a weapon, basically as a spearhead, a way to pretty much wipe out the entire continent and rid people of these primals, of these lesser beings. We could essentially also be included in that. What we refer to as beast tribes is such that the Empire could essentially look upon us in the same way, that we have the same style. But that is essentially from their perspective. So, we end up taking a turn in 1.0. The obvious <laughs> goal is to now thwart uh, Neil Van Darnus, and we have actually end up having an interesting ally in Gaius, essentially the Black Wolf who essentially doesn't necessarily think this is the best idea, but he has been ordered to stand down. So the rest of the time, we end up going and fighting Ifrit, we end up going and fighting Garuda, and that is essentially what happens. We, uh, <laughs> every patch, every day, the moon gets closer and closer and closer, and it ends up obviously culminating in the Battle of Carnot. This is something that has been talked about, this is something that plays into 2.0, very dramatically because essentially those that are referred to the war as the warrior of light is usually originally talking about 
the Battle of Cartano, and this is essentially where the end of the era trailer takes place. We have made some allies in essentially the various different Archons, these people of great importance who have been sent to help protect the realm. As the moon gets closer and it looks like the end is upon us, it is revealed that it has been housing the Elder Primal Bahamut. He then breaking free and wrecking the realm. What is the hero? What are we to do? We've been engaged with the battle with the Empire and now it appears that all is lost. But the Archon Louis Swa has a plan and he ends up summoning the Primal Phoenix. And having Phoenix being able to battle Bahamut, he is able to defeat Bahamut. And as Bahamut is raining down destruction on all the land, the Archon Louis Swa has a plan. First, he sends us five years into the future, to the start of 2.0. Now, his story concludes in 2.0, but we're going to go ahead and tell it here now. Obviously, then, Louis Swa himself gets enthralled by Muhammad. Muhammad is being slowly healed up, and as a part of the raid, it's to defeat him once and for all. We also see the conclusion of Neil de Van Darnus' story, in which that he is actually his sister. It's a little weird. <laughs> we're going to go fully into diving into it, but apparently Neil himself had died a long time ago and his sister ended up taking over the reins and in doing so, that is who ended up calling down the lesser moon Dalmode. Now it's at this point, all is seemingly lost. The warriors of light have been sent to the future and what is to be left of this game? There was a, actually a period of downtime between 1.0 and 2.0. This was a very long and interesting and arduous time, both as a gamer, as someone who follows the game, as someone who is excited. Nothing like this had ever been attempted before. So the story of 1.0 and 2.0, the story of Final Fantasy XIV, is also found in this downtime, in this waiting, the period of which the Warriors of Light are out of reach from our grasps and we have to wait. But we were given a promise. And so let's talk about that promise right now. So it's time now we actually talk about the story of A Realm Reborn. Life has returned to the world and for the past five years the citizens have worked to rebuild the land and recover what they have lost to the calamity that was Bahamut. Working to remember those forgotten to the light, these warriors of light are legends of the Battle of Cartano, where they are met both by the Empire and by the fierce Elder Primal. But everything is not as it should be. People are going missing, and it is soon discovered by the Scions of the Seventh Dawn that the Assians, who are not only responsible for bringing about the Seventh Calamity, they are also once again at work to bring about yet even more calamities to the realm. Their goal is to bring about the rejoining, an act that would restore the world as it should be, or is supposed to be, according to their ideals, obviously at a great cost of life and destruction to the Source. This is their goal, and they will stop at nothing to see it through. But there are many enemies and factions in the world of Eorzea, and the Scions, being led by Minfilia, are seeking to protect the realm, and have recruited many members to their cause. Members like Thancred, Alphano, Alizé, Oriange, Yustola make up some of the Scions. Now, Minfilia tasks Thancred with finding out what is causing the disappearance of so many people, refugees from Alaminga, and crystals in the area. It turns out the Almaja, a local beast tribe, are using these crystals to summon their god, the primal Ifrit. And in turn, he is tempering people to add to his power. If you're unaware, tempering is when a primal marks an individual for themselves, and it is rather uncurable. The only cure being death. The tempered individual will forever seek their master's will and thus add to their power. Now, primals are a major threat to the land because the more they can temper, the more powerful they can become. And the more powerful they become, the more aether that they need. And aether is obviously the lifeblood of the land, thus draining the aether from the land around it. These things, these monsters, these icons have to be put down. Now, what's really interesting about this encounter with Ifrit is that he also tries to temper the Warrior of Light, but is unable to do so because the Warrior of Light is already claimed by another. Now, we believe this to be the Blessing of Light or perhaps the Echo in which Heidelin herself has it down upon us. Now, while the Scions are busy fighting off Ifrit, Titan, and Garuda, the Empire is at work trying to dig up Ultima Weapon to fight off and destroy the Primals by absorbing their essence. The Black Wolf, Gaius Van Balsar, is leading the fight against the Primals and Eorzea, 
and he wants to free the people from their ignorant ways. He is a man who believes in the mission of the Empire and is guided by the Asian La Habrea, who, in possession of the body of Thancred, is leading the charge. This makes them fully aware of the Warrior of Light's movements and when and where to strike him down. Yet, despite repeated battles and disputes, the Warrior of Light brings together the Eorzean Alliance, with the exception of Ishgard, to help wage war and put the Warrior of Light against both the Ultima Weapon and La Habrea. Now, using Hydaelyn's Blessing of Light, the Warrior of Light strips the Ultima Weapon of the Primal Aether. Thus, Ultima Weapon ends up destroying the Praetorium using Ultima Magic, but it is the Warrior of Light who is protected by Hydaelyn's Light and dismantles it. La Habrea, then seizing this opportunity, attacks, but the Warrior of Light fulfills the vision at the beginning of the game by striking Thancred free from La Habrea's possession using a Blade of Light. With the threat of Garlean invasion lifted, the Grand Company leaders declare the beginning of the Seventh Astral Era. The Warrior of Light is then recognized and given said title. Now, obviously, this is a little bit premature, in my opinion. You can see from the cutscene that the, <laughs> the Elder Prophet Bahamut roars into action at that point. This is the conclusion of the level 50 storyline quest, and thus we start moving our way towards Heavensward. But we're not there quite yet. Now, as the dust settles, there are still forces at work. While the Asians' plan has been set back, they are far but gone. La Habrea has been defeated, but he is not dead. And a new player enters the stage, taking on the name Elidibus and presenting himself as the White Robe Asian, who tests the Warrior of Light's strength before disappearing. Rumors of spies and new primals, Leviathan, Rahamu, and Shiva are introduced to us, and Shiva at last starts to change the way that we actually view the power of primals. As from the body of a woman known as Lady Iceheart, Saint Shiva is summoned. Beyond that, Sir Emmerich of the Temple Knights of Ishgard has reached out to the Scions for help to watch over the Keeper of the Lake, the wreckage of the Garlean ship from 1.0, intertwined with the corpse of Midgar Stormer. Coming face to face with the worm, having been in slumber and resurrecting himself after all this time, the King of Dragons strips the Warrior of Light's Blessing of Light and seeks to have him prove himself to the Great Worm. Now, also during this time, a young Alpha Node decides with the help of Isilbard to form a new group called the Crystal Braves and to help try to keep the peace as well. So with so much going on, the Scions find a way to actually kill an Asian, but it comes at a great cost. The newest member of the team, Rumbria, ends up adding her Aether to a Blade of Pure Light to kill the Asian Nahalbreas, who's been trapped in Orosite. She ends up sacrificing herself, but in doing so, it has now been proven that an Asian can be killed. Nahabreus only ended up attacking because the warrior had his Blessing of Light stripped, so thus he could kind of press his advantage. Apparently there are rules that dictate how the Asians are able to interact with the source. And if all that wasn't enough, at this time Nidhogg decides to gather a new force of dragons to assault Ishgard. And while the warrior light is trying to muster the support of the Eorzean Alliance, Minfilia and Alphano reluctantly pledge the Scion's support, while the rest of the Alliance declined due to both domestic troubles and remembering Ishgar's reticence during the three Garlean invasions. The Warrior Light leads a band of volunteers to the Steps of Faith, Ishgard's main bridge, where they manage to repel attack, and the victory celebration is then held at Ulda in the hopes of pressuring Ishgard into the Alliance. At the banquet, however, Sultana Nanamo privately discloses to the Warrior Light her intent to dissolve the monarchy and erode the power of the Syndicate, which is a major element in Uldah's corruption. But the Sultana's wine is poisoned, with Telegi Adelegi accusing the Scions of regicide while denouncing Roban for his negligence. When Roban murders Adelegi, Ilsberg wounds his former friend as the Crystal Braves are actually to be revealed to be under the employ of another Syndicate member named Lolorito who arrests Roban and the Scions are forced to escape and end up splitting up during said escape. While the fates of the other members are unknown, a humbled Alphano and the Warrior of Light manage to escape with the help of Roban's son Pippin. Sid takes them to Corthus, where the Ishgardians grant them asylum from the Syndicate Pursuers. So that is the epic story of Final Fantasy, kind of what you need to know 1.0 and 2.0. There's a lot that we want to cover, and I'm going to dive into 3.0, 4.0, and the Crystal Tower to hopefully bring this series to a really set up spot for Shadowbringers. 5.0 seeks to help answer these questions, seeks to help reveal who is Hydaelyn and who is Zodiac. What is the Echo? What is the First? Can the Sundering be undone? Is there a better way? Do we really 
have options and what does it mean to be a warrior of light and a warrior of darkness and what does that mean for the future of the game and its story. This is really quite an exciting time to be a Final Fantasy player. Now at this time, I do thank you so much for watching this video. I know it's an epic uh, narrative. I know there's a lot here. I'm wanting to always keep diving into more of this. So I really appreciate when you watch this, when you like this, and when you share this video, it means a lot and helps out so much more than you know. Let me know if I missed anything. Let me know if I've got anything wrong in the comments below. I'll be sure to try to make sure I do a correction as this series goes on so that way we can have the most and best time with the experience of Final Fantasy XIV. I wish you luck, Warriors of Light. Uh, I wish you luck, future Warriors of Darkness. For work to game my name is Brian. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I will hope you have a fantastic day, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Hey, it's me. It's been a while since I talked to you guys directly like this way, but... Don't tell anybody. We've got even more epic content planned for this channel. The response has been incredible. We hope to see you. If you're new, hit subscribe, leave us a comment. I'd like to talk to you more about video games. I can't seem to speak my language. <laughs> All right.